You want to buy your first mountain bike. Amazing decision, best one you've ever made, and welcome to the mountain bike community. But it can be quite overwhelming. There's so many different styles and brands of bike. Knowing where to start can be quite daunting. So in this guide, I'm going to talk you through all different types of bike, what you should be looking for, and what represents a good deal. To do a proper job of this, we've teamed up with Decathlon, who have a great range of bikes for all abilities, but particularly aimed at the entry level. It's a great place to come to show just how many bikes they have in store. This information should help you out whichever brand you finally decide to go for. First thing you need to establish is how much you'd like to spend. And there's no right amount when it comes to buying your first mountain bike. But for around 250 pounds, you can get yourself a decent entry level bike. And for about 600 pounds, you can get a bike that's more than capable of riding technical single track terrain. Generally speaking, the more you spend, bikes become lighter, stiffer, more capable, and with more sophisticated components. Although I'd suggest not spending all your budget on a bike and saving some for some essential spares and accessories like helmets, pedals, and shoes. Right, let's start on the important things to consider when buying a bike. First, the bike type. So you have hardtails and full suspension bike. Hardtail, no rear suspension. Generally speaking, they are lighter, less complex, easier to maintain, and more affordable. Full suspension bikes, they add comfort, add control, but they're more expensive than a hardtail with equivalent components on there. Generally speaking, because they're just more complex, you've got extra components like the rear shock. Good full suspension bike starts at around 600 pounds. So they're the two most common bikes you see out there, hardtails, full suspension. You do get fully rigid bikes, but they're kind of a bit more niche. So once you've looked at that, you then need to think about what you're going to be doing on this bike. There's lots of different categories of mountain biking, but if we split it into two to keep it simple, there's the cross-country fitness end, and then there's the trail end, where you'd like to be riding slightly more technical trails, where the bike's going to need to be more capable of tackling trail obstacles like jumps and drop-offs. So built more sturdily, uh, not as light potentially, and as efficient as a cross-country bike that's aimed at pedaling fast, going fast, really at the fitness end of riding. The most common frame materials for mountain bikes are aluminium or carbon fibre. There are other options like steel and titanium, but they are quite rare. Uh, it's probably fair to say that entry-level to mid-level bikes are aluminium, whereas mid-level to high-level are carbon fibre. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't high-level alloy bikes out there. There definitely are. And for some people, it's still the no-nonsense durability of alloy frames that they love, even if they're spending the big bucks. Carbon fibre is lighter and stiffer than aluminium, but more expensive to manufacture. Also note that not all materials, whether aluminium or carbon, are created equally. And as a rule of thumb, the more money you pay for a frame, the lighter and the better quality, the greater the material and the manufacturing will be for both carbon and aluminium bikes. Aluminium can also be more easily repaired and recycled once it comes to the end of its life than carbon can. If you've seen anything so far about mountain biking and marketing, you'll probably see how bike manufacturers love to talk about how lightweight their bikes are. Why is that so important? Well, a lightweight yet strong bike is just going to be easier to pedal up, down and along. And trying to get the lightest bike you can for your money is probably going to have a positive uh, effect on your riding experience. Manufacturers can remove weight in the frame using a higher grade material or through clever tube profiling to remove excess material from where it's not needed. They can also remove weight by specking a better fork and shock. For example, an air fork or shock is lighter than a coil sprung version. For your first bike, I'd recommend going with an aluminium frame. Uh, it's what most people go for and it gives you great value. If you have got the cash for a carbon one, then go for it. But aluminium will be more than up to the job. Ask yourself the question, where am I going to be riding the bike and what type of riding will I be doing? And the geometry, or to keep it simple, the shape of the bike will make a difference to how that bike performs. Some bikes will do everything, but they'll be better at one area than the other. And definitely look at whether you want to be riding that cross-country fitness or you're going to be riding the trails, bombing down hills and flying off jumps. Bikes with more relaxed geometry, so slacker head angles, shorter stems and wider bars, are better at the trail type of riding, bombing down hills, whereas cross-country bikes will have steeper head angles and longer stems to get that weight more balanced towards the front end of the bike. 
Entry-level bikes tend to have those group sets at the lower end of the hierarchy, which makes sense, and they're perfectly good for your first bike. But it's worth looking at all the parts now, because sometimes to get the bike at the price point, the manufacturers will sort of substitute out some parts of the group set, some non-branded parts. Not necessarily a bad thing, they can be great value. Also, take a look at how many gears the bike has. And it's not necessarily the more gears you've got, the better. This bike here has got a small ratio cassette on the back, so quite tightly spaced together. And it's got a rear derailleur to change on the back and one on the front. This has got two chain rings. Some bikes have three. That's called two by or three by. Some only have one. The one by system has a single chain ring up front, but this is what all mid to high level mountain bikes have. It's simpler, it's lighter. You've got the big wide range cassette on there, so you still get a great range of gears and it's just easier to use. Brakes are a really important part of the group set and your off-road riding experience. Entry level bikes might have rim brakes or more commonly these V-brakes here. But when your riding starts to improve and you start riding more advanced terrain, they're really going to want disc brakes. Mechanical discs are better, hydraulic disc brakes are the best. Disc brakes offer consistent and powerful braking with better control and you only need to use one or two fingers. It's worth noting that if you do go for an entry level bike with rim brakes, try and get a bike that has the tabs on the frame and fork for the disc brakes and the routing so it's future proof. If you do decide to get disc brakes, it will fit that bike. Most mountain bikes will have a suspension fork at least. From around £600 and upwards, you'll start looking at full suspension bikes. And again, the more money you spend, the more sophisticated those suspension units are likely to be. So better materials, lighter, stiffer, and more adjustable. A suspension fork on a hardtail really takes the sting off the trail and makes it more comfortable. A full suspension bike, which means you can ride that tougher terrain, you'll stay in control better, it'll be more comfortable and it really does open up the amount of terrain you can ride. When it comes to suspension units, really at the entry level, I'll be looking at air shocks and forks. You can see there's no spring on the outside there and this is air inside this fork rather than a coil spring, which gives you that infinite adjustability by putting or taking away air pressure inside there. It's also lighter. Also take note of the suspension travel. 80 mil is good for general riding. 100 is about right for cross country. 100 to 120 makes it more capable. 130 millimeters plus really opens up to riding more challenging terrain and taking bigger hits. Comparing two full suspension bikes, one 600, one 900, you can start to see the differences in suspension units. Uh, just more adjustability. So this fork, you have got a lockout on there. So for riding maybe through a city, you don't want the, the fork to move. Also, you've got the preload to make it uh, harder or softer. Moving up to the more expensive bike, you've now got a mainstream brand. You've got a RockShox fork on there. You've got a lockout with remote, so up on the handlebars, you can do that super easy as you're riding along. That also does the shock at the same time. And you've got more adjustability in the damping, so you can change how that fork reacts. You can slow it down or speed it up, depending on the hits it's taking. So more adjustability and more user-friendly. Mountain bike wheels do come in different sizes. The old standard of 26 inches pretty much disappeared and now you get 27.5, confusingly also sometimes known as 650B, but more commonly 27.5, and the larger 29. Pros and cons of each of these, the bigger wheels do tend to roll over the little bumps a bit better. So you feel them less, you've got more control, bit more grip. Arguably the smaller wheels are a bit more maneuverable, starting to stop them. Do you often find that entry level bikes will come with quite cheap wheels because that is a really common place for people to start spending on upgrades straight away. When you do start thinking about upgrading wheels, that's where lightness and strength really matters because especially rotational weight, a heavy wheel will make your bike feel really heavy when it starts spinning. Also take a look at how your wheels are mounted to the bike. The cheap bikes tend to have quick releases, which are definitely useful, but they're not as strong, not as stiff or as light as a bolt through option. These bolt throughs also are likely to have a wider hub called Boost, Again, a bit stiffer. The higher end wheels also tend to have a wider rim profile, which sits really nicely. It makes your wider tires work really well. Also, they tend to be tubeless ready. That's a great upgrade when you start getting into mountain biking. It means you can get rid completely of little thorn punctures and hopefully pinch punctures as well. 
saddles are really specific. What one person might find really comfortable, another won't. Also, they're different from male to female. So it's something that's really common for people to change on their bikes. Also bear in mind that most mountain bikers, myself included, still ride in padded shorts. Most bikes don't come with pedals, or if they do, they're the super cheap plastic pedals that probably aren't worth using anyway. So now you've got a choice to make. You've got two different types of pedals. You've got flat pedals, ones that you can use uh, with normal shoes. Although it's probably worth saving a little bit of cash to get some proper riding shoes, because they'll offer a really good amount of grip to go with your flat pedals. Or clipless pedals, like these ones up here, so this is where you have a cleat that's screwed into the bottom of your shoe and that clips in mechanically to this uh, system here. So you're attached to your bike uh, and that is good for sort of more intermediate to advanced riders, great for efficiency when you're pedaling, but you're then committed to having to buy some specific clipless pedal shoes to go with these. Women's specific bikes tend to focus on the contact points to make account for those anatomical differences between men and women. So they tend to have a women's specific saddle, uh, a slightly shorter stem, but most bikes can be tweaked or customized to fit any sex or any size human being. If you look to the brake levers, most of the time you can adjust them so you can pull them in closer to the bar for shorter reach. All right, loads of information there. Hope you're still following. Anyway, let's take a look at some real life bikes, see what you get at different price points starting at what really is the entry level, about 300 pounds. This is the Rock Rider ST100. It's 299 pounds 99. It's got many of the things you should be looking for for a bike that price. ST stands for Sport Trail, so it tells you sort of what the bike is aimed at. Riding all around pretty much. It's an aluminium frame with 27.5 wheels. Three by seven group sets, so seven gears on the back, three up front. So 21 gears in total. It's got double walled alloy rims and a mix of the lower tier micro shift group set along with some unbranded parts of the group set as well. V-brakes on this bike, uh, when you start spending a bit more money, then you start getting the mechanical disc brakes, which are better in all conditions in wet light today. Uh, and definitely for this sort of money, I'd recommend going for a hardtail, because a full suspension bike for 300 pounds, you make too big a compromise, I think, on the rest of the components. You can see how they get this bike at such good value when you compare it to a more expensive bike. It does have lower grade materials. If you look at the bar stem and cranks, definitely lower grade materials. Also, uh, technology, you've got a, a quick release on the front and this sort of 15 mil bolt through on the rear. Definitely not as high tech as the more expensive bikes. Boss 300 pounds does get you your first entry level bike for exploring the outdoors off-road. It's the next jump up to about 600 pounds where you get a bike that is much more capable of riding single tracks and technical terrain. Bikes like this Rock Rider ST540S, which is a penny under 600 pounds, Yet yeah, now it's a full suspension bike with 120 minutes of travel front and rear. It's a 6061 aluminium frame again, 27.5 wheels. The big upgrade here as well is the hydraulic disc brakes, much more capable than V-brakes. You've got a mixture of the unbranding components still. Also see some brands like Tektro for the hydraulic brakes, great entry level components. Also Shimano, one of the biggest group set manufacturers out there. This is their lower end Altus, but nice to see some brands appearing. Also an X-Fusion rear shock. The quality of the components and the materials used definitely steps up from the 300 pound bike. You can tell by looking at the cranks and the oversized alloy bar and stem, they're just gonna be stiffer, more control, and the 120 minutes of travel front and rear really does make this bike more capable of riding rougher terrain and going faster, potentially having more fun in the woods. More money, less gears. So we're going from the three by seven, 21 gears on a 300 pound bike. Now we've just got a two by up front, nine on the rear, 18 gears. We've got an own brand Rock Rider fork up front that does have a lockout and an alloy steerer and quick release wheels front and rear. The 27.5 wheels do have the double wall alloy rims and are tubeless ready. For around 900 pounds, you get a bike like this, the Rock Rider ST900S. Now it's the same uh, frame as the cheaper bike, but now we get more quality, well-known brands. We've got a RockShox 30 fork up front, and that's air. But now that is actually 400 grams lighter than the suspension on the front of the 540S. Plus you've got more tech, more adjustability. You've got a remote lockout on the handlebars. So you can go from fully open front and rear to lock that suspension out to make it much more efficient, maybe for riding a smooth bit of uh, trail, just by twisting this on the handlebar. 
Even less gears now, you've now got the 1x11 system, which is the way that the mid-level and high-end bikes go. Like I said before, it's just simpler, it's much nicer to use, and now you get that big wide-range cassette, that's 1146. We're seeing brands like the X-Fusion Shock, and now we've got SRAM cranks, they're the one by. So you've got a 32-2 chaining with that tech on there to keep your chain nice and stuck in there so it doesn't bounce off. The ST900S also has upgraded lighter wheels and better, wider tires than the ST540S. Both the ST540S and the ST900S are great value bikes and easy to upgrade when you might feel the need or have the extra cash to do so, like wheels, brakes, or drop a post. Higher quality and half a kilogram lighter than the cheaper 540S bike. Also, for a similar price bracket bike, you might start to see some lower end carbon fiber frames come into these bikes. Doesn't mean they're better. A good quality aluminum frame can be lighter than a low end carbon bike, and quality aluminum frames will be butted. Basically, it means that parts of the frame will be thinner and lighter where you don't need it. Other parts will be thicker and stronger where you do. <laughs> E-bikes have exploded in popularity. You can see why fitness can be a bit of an entry barrier when it comes to riding mountain bikes, especially if you live somewhere hilly or mountainous, but they can just help you ride further and faster. They're a great tool for getting outdoors and having more fun. You can see why they've got so popular. They are more expensive for the equivalent parts because, of course, you've got extra bits. You've got a battery, a motor, and the controls, and they do weigh more. This Rock Rider EST100 is an e-bike hardtail, as you see. There's the battery. There's the rear hub motor. You've got three different power modes with assistance up to 250 watts, and will let you ride at a sporty pace for over two hours with that 380 watt battery and 42 newton meters of torque. The battery is made by Samsung. You've got a 6061 grade aluminum frame, uh, and you've got mechanical disc brakes, which is definitely needed where you've got the extra weight of an e-bike. On the front, you've got a 100 mil travel SR Suntour suspension fork. You've got a mix of unbranded group set on here and Tektro brakes, and you've got a one by system, eight gears on the back. Of course, you can get more for your money when you're buying secondhand, but it is riskier and you need to be knowing what you're looking for. Also, you don't want to be fueling bike theft, so make sure the bike you're buying is legit. Repairs and maintenance can be costly and parts will wear out. So check the frame for damage. If there is suspension, look at its condition. Consumables like tires and grips are easy enough to replace, but can cost a bit. Bearings aren't too expensive, but need a bit of mechanical knowledge to change. If not, you'll have to pay a shop, and new drivetrains can be expensive. If you don't have the knowledge on what to look for when buying a second-hand bike, then it's time to ask for advice. You can check out some of our videos we've done in the past about these things. Maybe ask some friends or get involved on the GMBN community on Facebook. So check a second-hand bike carefully because you don't have the advantages of buying new, like after-sale support and warranty. Also, if you're buying a reputable brand, you'll know that bike has been designed properly and tested. Decathlon have a brilliant scheme for your pocket and the planet called Second Life where they recycle, repair, and reuse bikes that have either been marked or used. They're sold in excellent working order with different condition grades, sold with 10 to 40% discount. You can look for schemes like Decathlon Second Life to buy a second-hand bike with peace of mind. Well, I only came in for a tire. I completely forgot that I needed some skis as well. Uh, anyway, hopefully you found this video useful. Once you've decided on the bike that you want, next thing you need to do is determine the correct size. Luckily for you, you've done a video on that as well, so check that one out. If you like this video, give us a like and a follow. And we've done more beginner videos as well, like uh, beginner clipless pedal skills. Check that out. Anyway, what else do we need? Paddleboard, I think. <laughs>